nuestra eh, iniciativa de investigación con dimensión de género nació para ayudar al SINAI, como comentaba, eh, a hacer frente sobre todo a los requerimientos de excelencia científica que empezaban a llegar desde Europa. Eh, sobre todo, como sabéis, para hacer eh, propuestas robustas eh, y obtener financiación de más de más y eh, del programa Marco Horizonte Europa o de otros, eh, o de otros fondos de financiación. Eh, en Navarra en concreto, quiero destacar a Navarra Biomed como entidad que ha sabido adelantarse y apostar firmemente por esta inno innovadora eh, forma de hacer ciencia excelente, así que otro, otra vez nuestro agradecimiento a Navarra Biomed por ser los líderes eh, y también a nivel internacional destaca, destacar perdón, la Women's Rain Foundation, que es la entidad con la que hemos comenzado a colaborar este año y en la que enmarcamos de nuevo esta jornada. Eh, pasando ya un poco a la logística de hoy, indicaros que la sesión de hoy también está siendo grabada y que la colgaremos en la web de Aditec, en el repositorio de la sección de investigación con dimensión de género, donde ya tenemos subidas las grabaciones de la sesión del 10 de octubre con María Teresa Ruiz Cantero y también la sesión del 4 de noviembre de, de, con Antonella Santuccioni, que es la CEO pro bono de la Women's Brain Foundation. En la sesión de hoy tenemos inscritas más de 100 personas, eh, aunque bueno, ahora todavía estamos 44 ahora mismo, eh, pero bueno, indicaros por eso mismo también que nosotros seguimos constatando el gran interés que esta temática suscita. Eh, y ahora sí, eh, voy a pasar a presentar ya en inglés eh, al ponente, a David Cirilo, y um, os recuerdo previamente que eh, al final de su presentación, bueno, durante toda la presentación podéis en, en la sección del chat de Teams eh, podéis es, ir escribiendo preguntas, pero sí que David las contestará en, la, en el bloque final, que dejaremos por lo menos 15 minutos para que o bien eh, a viva voz eh, o por escrito, como decía, le planteéis las, las preguntas al ponente. Eh, desde Aditec, desde luego, os invitamos a, a preguntarle a David porque de verdad que es una oportunidad eh, muy grande el tenerle hoy aquí como ponente en esta breve sesión y, y animaros de verdad a escucharle con atención y a intentar, a a, eh, como se dice, aterrizarlo a vuestra área de investigación y ver cómo, eh, cómo podría plantearse ¿no? esta, de una forma excelente esta eh, dimensión de género. Entonces, bueno, David, voy a presentarte ya en inglés, sé que me entiendes, pero... Um, David Cirillo uh, is a scientific advisor for the Women's Rain Foundation and head of the Machine Learning and Bi for my Biomedical Research Unit at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. His areas of expertise is data analysis and predictive modeling for precision medicine using network biology and machine learning. His research in precision medicine includes rare diseases and pa pediatric cancers as well as ethics of artificial intelligence. He is co-editor of the book Sex and Gender Bias in Technology and Artificial Intelligence, Biomedicine and Healthcare Applications, uh, Elsevier Academic Press, 2022. Uh, in 2011, he graduated in pharmaceutical biotechnology, graded outstanding cum laude, at Sapienza University of Rome, Italy, where he was awarded a merit-based paid internship in chemistry and pharmaceutical technology department. In July 2017, his PhD thesis created outstanding cum laude as well. <laughs> On the prediction of protein and nucleate acid interactions has been awarded the extraordinary prize of the Doctoral School of Biomedicine and University Pompeu Fabra de Barcelona, Spain. Uh, he also underwent high-level professional training in genome data analysis, predictive modeling, and deep learning. And he has participated in national and international conference, conferences and events, being one of them precisely one session with us in Pamplona uh, in 2022. So we know him since then. Uh, he, he served as peer reviewer in a number of scientific papers as well, and is currently uh, supervising a PhD. So welcome, Davide, and it is a great pleasure to have another great keynote speaker from the Women's Rain Foundation. So uh, whenever you are ready, Davide, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marusha, for the really nice uh, introduction. So I am uh, 
sharing the screen. Okay, so if you can uh, please confirm that you can see my slides. Yes, perfect, yes. Great, okay. So yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Marusha and uh, Aditek and all the organizers for giving me this uh, uh, opportunity. It's really a, a pleasure to be back, even if uh, online. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and it's a pleasure for uh, being here, like talking about uh, uh, sex and gender biases in uh, digital technologies and uh, artificial intelligence. So yes, let's uh, let's start. So let's start from uh, uh, quite a, an obvious uh, observation uh, that is the fact that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, everywhere uh, in a world that is more and more. Um, filled with uh, uh, digital devices and digital uh, terminals of, of, of different kinds, uh, artificial intelligence is really like exploding and finding finding uh, a, a lot of uh, applications, which, to be honest, uh, are are quite amazing. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes, for instance, they make uh, our lives uh, easier. If you think, for instance, of the you know the the AI for navigating our cars or the maps you know, that we use, um, or even make our life more fun. If you think about uh, you know like the, the all the recommender systems that we have in our apps, uh, and uh, that make us uh, you know like enjoy what we like, right? Uh, but <laughs> there is a big uh, um, but here that is about the fact that uh, all those technologies uh, can uh, also be tremendously uh, harmful and uh, if not implemented, if not developed uh, uh, well. And we are as a society more and more, uh, let's say, conscious about this also uh, thanks to uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that those problems related to artificial intelligence and uh, the, the, the harm that, uh, that this kind of technology can do in our society has been exposed uh, um, uh, time and time again. Uh, for instance, as you can see here in a number of, uh, of books, uh, best-selling books, uh, and also in uh, you know, newspaper. And this is something that, you know, unfortunately, this kind of, uh, of issues with, uh, with uh, AI and society is really like, you know, under the radar and, uh, and it's really, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's really, really easy, you know, to, to, be, uh, to, be, to be aware uh, of, of this. Um, now, the interesting thing is that, okay, it's not just about newspapers and, and the public science book. The more, let's say, um, warning uh, uh, aspects of all this is that all this, uh, let's say, concern is actually backed up by uh, also science. So, um, for instance, if you search the term AI bias in uh, PubMed, which is, uh, uh, you know, like a repository of uh, basically uh, biomedical and life sciences uh, literature, you can see uh, that you can find like uh, a lot of results, more than 7,000 papers in, uh, in life sciences that are talking about uh, AI bias. And, uh, and this actually, this trend, like as you can see from those, uh, from those curve, uh, grew in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in latest year, right? And uh, it's even more impressive if you search the same term, uh, AI bias, in uh, um, uh, ACM Digital Library, which is basically the, the, the same thing at PubMed, but for computer sciences. So remember that artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science. And so, like, you know, those are the papers that are actually talking about AI, AI bias from a more, let's say, technical point of view in a way. And, uh, and here, like the number of results is even higher. So we have like uh, uh, more than 87,000 documents that talk about uh, AI bias. And, and the trend is the same. So in recent year, we see like a, a growing attention of, uh, of um, you know, like these publications um, to this particular problem. Now, something that, uh, that caught my attention when uh, I was like, you know, searching this uh, a couple of days ago is that if you look closer, uh, the very first uh, instances uh, uh, of uh, AI bias in, uh, in computer science uh, papers are actually from the 50s, that are exactly like, you know, the, the time when uh, the term artificial intelligence start to become uh, popular, where, you know, like the, the, the very first uh, um, 
neural networks uh, like very simple that were like you know proposed by Rosenblatt and uh, and, and, and and others like uh, uh, start to, to to appear in the scientific scene right and this is quite significant because I mean it means that we have been discussing about uh, AI bias since the beginning then as you can see there has been like a long winter in which we we haven't talked about this and then in recent year uh, you know more science is produced uh, about that so this is quite, uh, this is quite, uh, you know, um, amazing because we can see that it's not just like you know books and newspaper, but it's also like science, and it's also like you know, in one hand the theory, if you want, like the computer science literature, and also the applications or at least some types of application in the case of the life sciences. Um, so. What is the problem? So what, what is this problem that we are talking about? So in order to understand, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the root of this uh, of these concerns uh, uh, with respect to uh, AI, we have to understand something that generally uh, in, uh, in the domain of machine learning, we refer to as garbage in, garbage out. So this is a saying that is very popular in this uh, domain. What does it mean? It means that uh, if you want to um, fit a model to your data, and your data has some kind of problem, this problem is going to be reflected in the model as well. So the outcome that you get from uh, applying this model is going to be as uh, problematic uh, as the input. Um, this is very like, you know, it's a very popular way of saying, of expressing this concept. Uh, but I personally don't like it a lot because it's kind of putting emphasis, especially on the input data, right? Uh, garbage in and then garbage out. Of course, like in order to guarantee the quality of, uh, of our AI models, uh, we have for sure to, uh, you know, pose to ourselves these questions, like for instance, how the data that we are going to use for training the AI model has been generated, how it has been collected, how it has been processed. There has been some kind of problem, some kind of systematic error uh, that uh, is, uh, you know, observable in in the in the processes that generate the data, and uh, and then, but this is not the only one question that we have to 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 make. We also have to question uh, uh, what is the model actually learning. So it's not just the input; it's, it's also like okay, the model that now we have, what is actually learning? Like what 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 is what is, for instance, like uh, the the importance that is attributed to the different variables that are used in this model. Is this model a black box? Uh, do we fully understand uh, uh, the, the reasons behind the specific decision that this system is taking? So, you know, analyzing the model itself. And then also, and this is very important, uh, the output. So how will the output be used in the real world? So who is going to use this model? Where are we going to deploy the model? Uh, is this going to be deployed only in certain country? Uh, is, is this going to be used by, um, by specific people or not by others? Or is going to be affecting only uh, uh, or, or favoring only certain sectors of the society and, and others not? So as you can see, garbage in, garbage out. OK, it's a very simplification, but we have to analyze you know, uh, all those errors, all those problems, all those you know, uh, impacts, uh, negative impacts in the society from different point of view, the input, the model and the output. OK, so what what is the problem itself? So when, when we say those in negative impacts, those errors, what what we are referring to? So this is what we generally call in uh, like broadly as biases. So a bias is uh, a systematic error that can be made, first of all, by a human in which case we would talk, we would talk about uh, cognitive bias or by a machine in which case we would talk about algorithmic bias and this just in this line let's say is the official definition of what a bias is that is borrowing from uh, psychology in the case of cognitive biases and uh, um, uh, machine learning in the case of uh, uh, algorithmic bias now uh, this is quite self-explanatory, but but what I uh, always like to add to this uh, uh, to this um, uh, definition is also the second line uh, that says basically that those systematic errors can lead to a disadvantage for an individual or a group of people 
that can be identified by personal attributes, like, for instance, sex, gender, age, ethnicity. So it's not just like, you know, a systematic error that, for instance, a machine is making, because if this error would be negligible, uh, so we do not have to worry about that. The problem of, of uh, uh, algorithmic bias, in most cases, is that those are actually systematic error that leads to uh, that have a negative impact in the society. So that really like, creates a, disad a disadvantageous um, situation for specific people. And those specific people are specific because we can identify them by um, distinct uh, personal attributes like sex and gender and so on. Uh, so in a way, an artificial intelligence can act as a double-edged sword because, uh, as I said at, at the very beginning, like uh, artificial intelligence is really good. Like it's it's really, you know, helpful in many situations. Uh, actually, it can even be like some kind of like you know tool for uh, you know like democratizing values and so on and so forth. It can even like help reducing inequalities, um, uh, especially if this artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is integrating personal attributes, like, for instance, sex and gender differences. Think about uh, uh, personalized medicine. So, of course, if we want to realize personalized medicine, we want an AI tool uh, that is able to diagnose better a disease and that is using uh, sex and gender differences, for instance, in a proper way. So by using those real factual differences, this tool can lead to a better diagnosis and can lead to the, real the realization of personalized medicine. The problem arises that the same tool can actually also magnify inequalities if instead of integrating uh, sex and gender differences, is integrating uh, sex and gender biases. So essentially differences that are not real, uh, that just stem from the errors not that we saw before, or from stereotypes or from uh, uh, um, you know uh, aspects that can be discriminatory in the long uh, in the long run so ai can act as a double edged sword because it can if used correctly can uh, do good but if if used improperly it can be actually very uh, very harmful and here i'm taking as, as an example sex and gender attributes because I mean, those are extremely relevant, as, as we will see uh, later, but you can replace those, uh, those personal attributes with uh, ethnicity, age, or any other kind of uh, personal attribute that you might think uh, of, right? Okay, so since we are talking about sex and gender, let's clarify <laughs> what is sex and what is gender. I think that um, you all have uh, uh, more or less an intuition uh, about, uh, about this, but just to be everybody on the same page, uh, the, 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 the actual definition is essentially the following. So when we talk about the, the sex attribute, we are talking about uh, biological uh, aspects of an individual. And, uh, and this is not just a matter of chromosomes. Of course, there are like, you know, a different set of uh, uh, sexual chromosomes for female individual and male individual. Uh, but, you know, like the sex determination is also uh, governed by the genes that are on those chromosomes and also on the autosomal chromosomes, possible variants or mutations that you uh, that you may have, uh, the aspects of the reproductive uh, organs and genitalia that uh, that uh, you know the let's say the, the actions of those genes uh, uh, can lead to, uh, as well as uh, secondary sexual. Uh, um, uh, characteristics like, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, the bird or, or breasts, and also, of course, the hormones you know, that can uh, provide uh, further uh, variability in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, sex, right? So when we talk about sex, we are talking about biological aspects, and uh, uh, this can be very complex, and it can, like, you know, depend to, um, from many different, uh, uh, let's say, molecular and uh, phenotypic uh, uh, things. When we talk about gender, it's something completely different because when we talk about gender, we are talking about uh, um, something that is more cultural, something that aspects that are more related to um, uh, the, the societal uh, experience, not the experience of an individual in the society. And so we are talking about role and responsibilities of men and women. We are talking about uh, attributes that are associated even psychologically to, uh, to the different genders 
or also, uh, and this is a, a little bit uh, uh, even more problematic from a societal point of view, entitlements. So, you know, what we expect from one gender or the other in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, financial dependence uh, or autonomy, uh, the participation in the workforce, uh, and so on and so forth. Those two terms, as you can see, are very different, but most of the time they are like either used in interchangeably uh, or one is affecting the other. In particular, the concept of gender is uh, very much affected by uh, the concept of sex, especially for, let's say, the, the, the appearance no, of, uh, of, uh, of, of a person. Um, but those are like, you know, two completely different aspects. One that is pointing to biological uh, characteristics, the other one that is pointing to um, uh, cultural, sociocultural uh, aspects, okay? Okay, and, uh, and so unfortunately, in, uh, when we apply artificial intelligence uh, uh, to, uh, you know, different, uh, in different uh, domains uh, uh, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our life, uh, we, we see a lot of uh, examples in which basically we have a sex and gender uh, bias, uh, or both, or like, you know, two uh, different types of biases. And here we have some examples. So, for instance, in the case of uh, machine translation, so machine translation nowadays is done uh, using uh, uh, artificial intelligence systems, and those artificial intelligence are um, trained uh, based on uh, text. So if you want to train a model for translating from one uh, language to another, you basically have to have, uh, you know, like, a lot of texts in the two uh, aligned uh, between the two uh, the two languages that you want to translate. Now, uh, what happens if you uh, want to translate, for instance, uh, uh, a term like uh, uh, doctor uh, or secretary in a language uh, uh, like, for instance, Spanish that uh, is uh, uh, actually gendered? So you have to translate it, uh, for instance, uh, doctor or, or doctora, uh, depending on uh, on the gender of this person. Now, what it has been shown uh, many times is that, uh, um, uh, you know, like in those texts that you are using for training those, uh, those models, uh, you have a lot of uh, historical uh, uh, stereotypes. And so, for instance, uh, the, the word secretary is always associated to uh, the feminine uh, word. And so, like, uh, this is, it's much more probable that those models are going to, like, translate the word secretary into a feminine uh, corresponding translation. While in the case of the word doctor, uh, uh, this is, is, you know, like it's found to be generally associated to the masculine word. And so like this is generally translated into a masculine uh, uh, noun. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, a, a famous case is Google, Google Translator. Some years ago, it was translating from uh, Turkish, which is a gender neutral uh, uh, idiom uh, to, to English. And, uh, and as you can see, like it was extremely biased toward the masculine translation. Nowadays, if you use Google Translate, uh, uh, you have both, uh, both translations. But, you know, if you, if, if you, like, you know, if you write more complex sentences, you will see that this problem is actually far from being resolved. And uh, all the other examples that you can see here, uh, I can, like, you know, just briefly talk about, uh, uh, about them, but are all examples of uh, gender bias, sex and gender bias. Like, for instance, here in uh, the domain of uh, automobile engineering, uh, the uh, mannequins that are used for the crash testings um, historically has been used with uh, features and a morphology that is much more resembling a man than a woman. And this exposed, in a way, all the, the problem that uh, the design of a car uh, um, uh, has uh, for women. And actually, like, uh, sometimes even, like, uh, even if they introduce mannequins that have, like, you know, like a, a morphology of, uh, of, a, of a woman or, like, you know, like a typical, let's say, um, um, body morphology uh, of a woman, you can see that they put the, the mannequin not on the driving seat. So they even, like, you know, even more um, uh, promoting this, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, stereotypes. The same for uh, robotics. So in robotics, uh, uh, most of the time, in a quite uh, unjustified way, the type of uh, resemblance of those uh, of those uh, you know machines uh, are uh, those of uh, of women, uh, or uh, which uh, you know with a specific let's say um, 
characteristics and, uh, and also the stereotypical association between uh, something uh, servile and, and docile, not that as a robot that needs to be like a woman. And so this is also like, quite uh, controversial. And um, in the case of uh, artificial intelligence used, for instance, for this disease uh, diagnosis, this is the case of stroke. So in stroke, basically, you have symptoms that are in common between men and women, which are the ones that you can see here. And then you have symptoms that are more specific only on of women, but that are less frequent and are also less more difficult to detect. So if you are training, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, an app for the mobile phone uh, that has to detect uh, uh, the, the risk of stroke based on uh, self-reported risk, of course, this, uh, this model is going to like work much better with symptoms that are more common than the ones that are less common. The problem is that the ones that are less common are specific of women. And so the, 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 the most of the problems with this kind of apps are going to affect uh, only women. And so this creates, you know, this disadvantage that we were uh, saying before. And uh, in image generation as well, like in this case, for instance, the prompt was uh, um, a journalist. And, uh, and the bias here is not only a, a, a gender bias, uh, but also like uh, uh, with um, linked to age. So apparently a, 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 um, a woman a journalist uh, it must be young and, and beautiful, while uh, a, a, a man journalist uh, can also be a seasoned uh, person. And, uh, and then, like, you know, the big problem of the use of AI for curriculum selection, in particular for technical roles, that is essentially creating this uh, huge uh, gap between, uh, like, you know, employing uh, uh, women uh, uh, instead of men for technical roles and, you know, promoting, like, you know, this kind of uh, uh, stereotypes also in, uh, in terms of, uh, of the workforce. Um, so... Uh, in the case of the of the image uh, generation, we saw that uh, it was a problem of uh, gender bias, but also of age bias, right? And this is uh, when we have like an intersection of different attributes, and the bias that is resulting is actually coming from, uh, you know, different attributes. Uh, we talk about uh, intersectionality. So uh, the concept of intersectionality is very important because. Those biases are not like, you know, living alone in the, in the void. We are in a society in which, like, you know, we have all those different attributes that, uh, uh, that play a role all together. And so they are uh, most of the time intertwined. And, uh, and this was like, you know, uh, discussed a lot uh, in, uh, in this particular uh, example. So uh, there was a, an MIT student and uh, she was uh, basically studying the performances of different uh, um, software. Uh, for facial recognition. So those systems are the one that you find, for instance, in the airport, no? when, uh, when you, you, know, you have those cameras and they have to recognize the face. So the task of the AI is just to recognize the, the shape of the face and uh, instead of something else. And, uh, and so like she uh, noticed that uh, uh, they, the performances of those uh, AI systems were extremely poor, poor with a darker uh, female faces. And, uh, and you know how like this person realized this is quite actually a, a, an impressive story. So uh, basically this MIT student is Joy uh, Bulanwini and she was noticing that essentially like those systems were not able to recognize her own face but the faces of her colleagues, uh, they were recognized. And she realized where, you know, that, that, that there was a problem with the, the, the color of the skin and, and her uh, uh, gender uh, when she finally put a white mask uh, on her face and, uh, and the system recognized that as a face. So this is quite a you know, very impactful story uh, that is, uh, you know, like highlighting uh, the, the importance of intersectionality and also like, you know, the realization that there is a problem from the communities that are mostly affected by uh, those, uh, uh, these kind of problems, right? Uh, okay, so uh, the question is, where those biases come from? Like where, where they appear in the life cycle of artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence uh, uh, system development? So in this uh, picture that you have here, uh, you can see this life cycle of uh, artificial intelligence. So when you want to create an AI model, the way in which you do this is essentially you identifying from the word a population 
that you want to study, maybe you want to measure something, and you create a data set. And then you want to use this data set to um, train a model for a specific task. This can be, for instance, diagnosing a disease or whatever it is. In order to assess the performances of your model, you uh, generally want to choose some benchmarks. So you want to use external data sets that, can, that you can compare with. And when you are happy with the performances of your model, you are going to release the model again in the, in the world. And maybe like this, this model is also like, you know, helping in identifying the population and, and so on and so forth. So this is basically like, you know, like a cycle of, uh, of the AI life, if you want. So the biases can appear at every single point in this, uh, in this chart. So, and we can start, for instance, from uh, highlighting the biases that are associated with uh, the data generation. So those can be, for instance, uh, historical biases, like the one that we were analyzing before for the machine translation. So maybe you are using data that uh, historically contains traces of uh, st stereoty stereotypical representations or stereotypical or uh, discrimination. Uh, then when you are identifying a specific population, you can have, uh, for instance, representation biases, because maybe like this, this population has been selected in a way that it doesn't represent uh, some minorities or that, yes, or, or that excludes certain people, uh, even in, in an unconscious way. So this can be done like, you know, consciously or an unconsciously, but still, uh, you know, you can have this representation bias. And then when you create your data set, uh, you want to measure something on this, uh, on this population. And so you can incur a measurement bias. For instance, imagine that you are, uh, you know, like you are measure something with a device that has not been calibrated for men and women differentially. And so you are basically using one size fits, fits all type of approach, and this can create a measurement bias. Maybe something can, is not detectable in, in, a, in, a, um, in a population if it's not calibrated properly. And then there are the biases that are associated to the model building and implementation. And so, for instance, you can, uh, uh, you know, train your model with data sets that come from different sources. So you can like aggregate different data sets. And of course, you can have an aggregation bias because if you do not normalize, if you do not harmonize these, uh, these uh, different data sources, you can have problems. Then uh, you can have evaluation biases. So depending on the benchmark that you choose to use, you can, uh, you know, you can have like a, a better or worse performance, no? Uh, so it really depends on the choice that you can have. And then finally, uh, as we said before, when you are deploying the final, uh, the final uh, uh, model in the world, you can uh, decide to release this only in certain countries or maybe like to be this accessible only to certain people and so on and so forth. And so you can have like a deployment uh, uh, bias. So those are just six biases. But the taxonomy of bias is huge and you can have like many, many, many different types of biases that can, you know, pop up in different uh, in different moment moments of this uh, of this life cycle. And uh, so here there is like a, a, an example uh, uh, about representation bias. So one of those biases that we were seeing before in the domain of uh, uh, genomics. So in genomics, especially uh, with genome wide association studies, it has been highlighted in the literature most of the time that uh, you can have like uh, a representation bias because you can have in those populations, in those big, large cohort, some minorities that might be less represented. And so as a result, when you are identifying a relationship between, for instance, a variant and a specific trait, uh, this cannot be like, you know, reflective of this underrepresented population. So in this example is actually like uh, the way in which GWAS should be performed. So uh, those authors, um, uh, they run a GWAS uh, for a female cohort and also another one for the male cohort. And as you can see, there are like a series of uh, loci you know, that, that can be associated with this particular trait. I don't remember what it was. It, I think it was like about diabetes, but that are basically present only on, uh, on female and not on male. So if you were to put everything together, Essentially, you would have missed those uh, those signal, and uh, uh, and so like you know all the conclusions that you get are completely uh, misled. Another example is uh, of the deployment bias that we discussed before. Um, this is 
quite you know like uh, quite apparent uh, uh, considering for instance the digital divide that exists uh, in the world so in these uh, statistics here you can see the different uh, uh, probabilities that a woman uh, is uh, to, um, to to own a mobile phone so the higher the value the less likely a woman is the owner of a mobile phone so if you are for instance deploying a model that is running on a mobile phone maybe this is an app or whatever it is uh, if you are uh, releasing this in europe you have like you know a kind of equal ownership of mobile phone uh, between men and women but if you uh, are deploying this in south asia men are much more likely to own uh, a mobile phone and so like essentially you are excluding a part of the population from using this uh, uh, this ai um, app or or you know this system so uh, deployment bias you know can arise also be due to this kind of situation right that depends on, on geography and the different uh, the different uh, you know like situations that you can have in different places um so uh, what are the type of solutions so for for this so we will see in the next slide that there are like many things that we can do but from a technical point of view something that for sure you can do is to use a series of uh, techniques uh, that generally go uh, under the umbrella term of uh, uh, machine learning fairness so this is the name of the discipline that is like producing this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, tools um, those are libraries uh, that, that, that essentially you can use in order to uh, identify if there are problems with your data uh, and with your models and uh, this specific example is an open, an open search uh, an open source toolkit for bias detection and mitigation that is produced by IBM so even if it, this is produced by IBM, it's open source, and, and it's actually quite nice because in the web page they have a demo so that you can you know, get a, an idea on how this works. And also they released um, a Python library that you, can, uh, that you can use programmatically uh, in your developments in order to you know, apply all this kind of evaluation. And here you can see, for instance, like you know, some metrics uh, that you can get like from the original data compared to the mitigated data and you can see that they are uh, fairer than before so it's this kind of like you know indicators uh, and uh, and actions that you can uh, that you can take on the algorithms and the data so that uh, so so to make like all this more uh, more fair uh, more in general let's say less technical but more in general there are uh, many things that we can do. So, uh, for instance, um, McKinsey uh, uh, um, explained those six ways forward uh, for AI practitioner and also like stakeholders of artificial intelligence uh, that are quite, uh, you know, that are really good because they are touching on all the different aspects, you know, that uh, of the things that that we can do to mitigate bias. So, uh, first of all. We have to be aware of uh, the context in which artificial intelligence can help correct for bias and those in which there is a high risk for AI to exacerbate bias. So this is exactly what we saw before with the double-edged sword. So there are some contexts in which like uh, AI can be very useful if developed properly and other contexts in which uh, if not developed properly can be extremely harmful. So be aware of those scenarios. The second one is to establish processes and practices to test for and mitigate bias in AI system. And this is the library that I was showing you before. So there are, you know, tools that are maybe like, you know, more technical, uh, more, let's say, for developers, but that can, like, you know, practically speaking, be used in order to mitigate bias at different levels. The third is about uh, engaging in uh, fact-based conversation about potential biases in human decision. And this is crucial. This is what I was saying before about talking with the communities that are going to be affected by bias or that you suspect could be affected by that. And this is very important. In a previous work, uh, we have been, uh, for instance, uh, um, contacting with uh, an organization uh, of uh, uh, very big in Spain. Um, this is an LGBTQ uh, um, organization and uh, and we were like you know organizing focus groups to understand uh, what is the relationship and the impact of artificial intelligence for this specific community and it was quite revealing because uh, uh, you know you really have to hear from the personal experiences of people in order to understand that uh, you know the tool that you are developing might be 
problematic for certain people and not for others, right? The fourth is to fully explore how humans and machine can best work together. And this is about human machine interaction. So there are a lot of uh, application, a lot of ways in which this artificial intelligence can be deployed. And uh, some of them are really easy to be used and we can get very used to that. For instance, think about ChatGTP. ChatGTP is just like, you know, like a, a box in which you make a question. This is very easy to use and it's very easy to, you know, get used to this and, and not questioning because it's so easy to use that, uh, you know, and the performances are, are so good that, uh, uh, that, you know, like if there are some problems, uh, you can uh, kind of yeah, can, like, you know, overlook this because just because it's very easy to use, right? Uh, the fifth is about investing more in bias research. And uh, I mean, I completely agree about that because as a researcher in this domain, but also because it's very necessary. Uh, so there is a lot to be discovered in, uh, in this uh, domain. Also, from uh, even from a theoretical point of view, we were thinking, we were discussing before about intersectionality and the fact that those biases are a lot and they can be intertwined. It's really difficult to disentangle these things. And, uh, and there are currently, I mean, some indicators and some uh, studies, but there is a lot to be done. And of course, like, you know, funding uh, for, for this kind of research is very important. And the last one is about uh, investing more in diversifying the AI field itself, which in other words means bring more inclusion and diversity in the STEM wor world, especially in terms of, uh, of women. So uh, AI, as we mentioned, is a branch of computer 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 science, and uh, computer science has, has a big problem in terms of uh, involvement of uh, of women uh, in uh, in this discipline. Of course, there are female engineers, uh, and, and 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 they are really good, but uh, uh, you know more uh, should be done in this sense, especially to let's say also at high level of uh, of the of the hierarchy. So, and I'm thinking about. You know problems related to the glass ceiling, especially in in specific uh, in specific disciplines, in specific uh, domains. Okay, so um, what we are doing uh, about that in terms of like you know the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the Women's Brain Foundation. So first of all, the BSc and the uh, WBF. Uh, we collaborate uh, for uh, we have been collaborating for many years actually. Uh, the other day I was thinking about that is almost a decade because I have been first in contact with them uh, at around 2016, I think. And uh, and so like it has been a long journey and we have been doing a lot uh, uh, together. And uh, actually the very first uh, outcome uh, from this uh, collaboration is uh, a paper that we published in uh, Nature Digital Medicine in 2020. And it's funny because uh, now Nature Digital Medicine uh, has a super high impact factor, is like a, a very high type, uh, you know, journal. But at the time, it was, it, I think, like in 2020, they didn't even have an impact factor. So it was like, you know, amazing to be pioneering, like, you know, this journal. And uh, and it was it was really like, you know, uh, cool to uh, to talk with the editors, you know, about uh, publishing something like that. And what we published was actually quite uh, revolutionary. It was uh, this uh, um, survey about sex and gender uh, differences and biases in artificial intelligence, especially for those technologies that uh, are more promising for precision medicine, in which sex and gender uh, characteristics are very important to, to be taken into account. And so those technologies are, for instance, uh, big data analytics, uh, natural language processing, robotics, digital medicine. So when we published this paper, we ended up with so much material uh, that uh, essentially a couple of years uh, later, we could write an entire book about this. And this book, uh, uh, it was mentioned before by Marusha, and actually it's, uh, the I think, the very first scientific book on this specific topic of sex and gender bias in AI. And uh, it has been praised a lot by, uh, uh, you know, important figures in the, in the field. Uh, for instance, Professor Londa Schiebinger from Stanford University, and she, like, you know, she was uh, advocating for having uh, this book or these discussions integrated into medical school uh, uh, curricula, which is like, you know, a sign also of uh, 
you know, how lacking is this kind of conversation in, uh, in the uh, educational system, right? It's very important uh, to uh, talk about this also uh, in, uh, in, in terms of like, you know, educating people know about that. So as you can see from all those logo in the slide, uh, um, uh, you know, like a, a major achievement of this work is like, you know, gathering together people from many different uh, uh, backgrounds, not only from academia, but also from uh, uh, from the industry, which also which is also like, you know, highlighting how this specific topic is of interest uh, uh, in uh, the whole range of, uh, of uh, the scientific, uh, uh, you know, like um, uh, in, in the scientific field. Uh, so we went on, of course, like BSC and, uh, and the Women's Brain Foundation. Uh, producing a lot of uh, a lot of publications, so we are really fostering like research in this uh, uh, in this domain. And why I'm showing uh, like you know all those papers, I'm showing all those papers because it's interesting the fact that uh, some of them, for instance, those two here, um, this one about uh, um, you know like a, an analysis of uh, of bias in uh, Twitter uh, in, in with respect to abortion and miscarriage topics. And also this other one, raising awareness of sex and gender bias in artificial intelligence, like those two works, they actually come from uh, events that we organized together. So in the case of the Twitter analysis, it was an hackathon that we organized uh, with the Women's Brain Foundation and then ended up with a publication. This is really nice. And this other one is uh, a series of uh, uh, conferences that we organized in Barcelona together. Uh, that ended up in uh, uh, in a publication as well because we developed a, a methodologies a methodology and we wanted to share this uh, with uh, with the scientific community. So you know it's a kind of a virtual virtuous example that uh, is not just like you know limited to making a study and publishing, but it's also like everything that surrounds this. It's like a series of activities that uh, really entails many different uh, actions that is not just like you know the the the, the research itself which is uh, of course important and um, another example of this uh, approach to the scientific production and to like you know the, the fostering uh, research in this sense is a european project in which we are both uh, involved uh, that is coordinated by bsc and will start in january that is called uh, ahead so this is a, a European project that is uh, uh, part of the Staff Exchanges program. So Staff Exchanges is a program of the European Commission that is funding for mobility. So we essentially created a network, uh, an international network of uh, partners, and uh, all those people are going to move around in order to share experiences and uh, in particular collect um, metrics and indicators uh, for the transdisciplinary evaluation of artificial intelligence with a special emphasis on sex and gender bias. So what does it mean, a transdisciplinary evaluation of AI? So if you have an AI system and you want to evaluate this, uh, the way in which this is generally done is by looking at technical uh, indicators, like for instance, you know, like accuracy, precision, recall, the typical things, right? Um, but this is not enough. So what we are proposing in this project is actually to uh, collect, uh, you know, indicators and metrics also from other points of view, from the legal point of view, from the um, commercial point of view, economic point of view, from the environmental point of view, from the sociological point of view, from the psychological point of view. So you can like, you know, you can have like this constellation of different uh, indicators that we are gonna like implement into a platform that can be used for making a comprehensive evaluation of uh, an artificial intelligence system for uh, applications in in health and uh, and so well i mean those indicators can be you know grouped in the three major classes the technical ones the the ones that are pointing to human interactions and the ones that are more let's say societal so it's quite an interesting project that, as I said, is going to start in January. We are going to, you know, like uh, collaborate uh, on on this together, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to see, like, you know, what kind of uh, of outcomes will uh, uh, will uh, we will have from uh, from this uh, from this experience. Um, okay, I would like to finish up with uh, uh, some, uh, you know, like some slides on. Uh, the data because you know at the very beginning uh, we started from uh, garbage in garbage out no uh, saying that the input data is uh, you know like it's part of the it's part of the game but uh, but you know we have to 
make emphasis on the model and the output. And so we talk about like, you know, those uh, uh, deployment bias and, and what, what's not, but still the data is important. So I would like to spend like, you know, the, the, the final slide talking about uh, how the, the, the data production, so the way in which the data that then uh, are used for developing AI uh, systems uh, can be, let's say, the source of bias that is then propagated by those systems. And I'm not like uh, specifically thinking about human data. Actually, I, I am more thinking about preclinical data because we have to really, you know, take into consideration that experimental data is actually the starting point of, of everything. And uh, that and the way in which this uh, experimental data, especially in animals, is produced can, can then affect uh, all the conclusions and the assumptions that uh, lead, for instance, um, um, to the development of a specific uh, uh, drug, uh, if you analyze you know, the typical path of development of, of a drug. So if you are using uh, only male mice, you are going to find evidence for something that is of the male um, physiology. And then you are going to maybe like more inclined to run a clinical trial in which uh, maybe there are more men and uh, developing a drug that, that uh, when it the market is gonna inevitably have side effects on women. So we really have to pay attention to those first steps because otherwise we are gonna like produce a lot of data uh, that then can be like used by the AI for making some, uh, uh, you know, some predictions or can also like by themselves have a, a, an harmful uh, effect in, in our society. Um, and one example that is quite revealing is, for instance, the uh, pain mechanism. So it has been shown uh, in the past that uh, um, the, 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 you know, the hypersensitivity to mechanical pain in mice is uh, conveyed by different uh, cell types in, uh, in male mice and female mice, specifically in male by the microglia and uh, in the case of female by uh, T cells and other cells. So if you are only doing experiments using, for instance, male mice, you are just basically getting information on the physiology of one uh, of one sex and on the other. And uh, if you then translate this, uh, you know, to also the way in which, for instance, like clinical trials are organized and all the problem in organizing proper uh, clinical trials, you can really see that there might be like, you know, that there is like actually a, a skewed situation in terms of men and women representation in clinical data. So this is data from uh, the year 2015-2016 uh, for uh, new mole molecular entities. So a new molecular entity is basically a compound that has been, that is very promising and that is gonna go on uh, in, the, in the market, right? And so in, uh, in that year, for instance, uh, you can see that in some, uh, uh, in some cases we have like, you know, in some, uh, you know, medical domains, we have like a more balanced uh, situation, while in, in other, uh, we definitely have not. And it's quite, you know, like worrying that, uh, especially in rheumatology, we have, for instance, that year for those uh, uh, new molecular entities, more men and, uh, and less women. So we really have to pay attention because if you already have like problems in uh, in uh, like you know choosing uh, uh, some mice, not the sex of some mice, and then we are also running uh, clinical trials uh, in this uh, uh, you know like uh, uh, imbalanced way. Of course, like the type of conclusions that we can have uh, can be quite uh, uh, you know misleading. And uh, and actually, if we then like analyze the pharmacovigilance uh, data. Uh, we can see that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, drugs are actually then retired, withdrawn from the market uh, because of greater health risks in uh, in women. So this is data from uh, basically ten years ago. So you can uh, well twenty years ago. So you can see you can imagine how much more drugs have been uh, have been uh, you know um, withdrawn from the market uh, uh, since then, and it's quite worrying. Um, so what what can we do, like uh, in order to to make this preclinical data more um, you know more uh, more fair in terms of like you know sex representation? So uh, in this paper, in this science from 2019, uh, it is uh, you know recommended to first of all perform experiments in order to 
assess if there is like a clear um, sex difference. Uh, so if uh, you cannot find any sex difference, factual difference between uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 you know, what you are measuring, the results, not the outcome of your experiments in uh, male and female mice, you can uh, go on with uh, with like that. But in the majority of the cases, what you are going to find are actual potential differences. And so you have to uh, consider increasing uh, the numbers of both sexes, right? So that you do an experiment with the ma male mice and experiments with the female mice. Now, what is the critique here? The critique here is that this, of course, comes with uh, more budget. So you need like, you know, the double of budget, like you need the double of mice. Uh, but this is actually not true because uh, uh, there are some statistical tests, for instance, that you can uh, run with your data that that, you know, with simulations, like, for instance, you can uh, you can assess what is the minimum number of animals with both sexes that you can use in order to uh, reveal like the treatment effect uh, in a significant way. And uh, so, for instance, the two times two factorial design, you can use a two-way ANOVA. There are different ways in which you can get to this conclusion. And this can help your budget because you can really like, you know, reduce the number of, of animals uh, to the minimum, still sure to, to find like a, a, an effect, a treatment effect, and also addressing, uh, you know, both sexes uh, separately. So my recommendation is to dig more into, you know, the statistics of these kind of things in order to and not be like, you know, um, to, to not have like a, a, a pre pre preconceptions, right? Like you don't to not be, um, um, uh, you know, to not think that that this comes with a lot of budgetary uh, effort because it's uh, definitely not uh, not the case in some in the in the majority of the cases. OK, OK, so then uh, something else that you need to to take into to consideration is also the role of the experimental uh, the experimenter and the gender of the experimenter. So the person that is manipulating the uh, those animals, uh, the effect that they can have on on the final results. And this is because, uh, you know, like uh, the, those animals can be very sensitive to um, uh, to the gender of uh, uh, of the person that is working with uh, with them, together with other environmental uh, environmental aspects like, for instance, the room temperature, the the way of caging, uh, uh, the diet. But it's quite interesting that also the staff, because of like you know uh, maybe the the type of perfumes that uh, that people use, or maybe like you know some chemicals in the air. Uh, but there are like you know a lot of literature that is describing uh, this confounding effect that can uh, that can happen. So be be aware of uh, of this. And one way of being aware of this is actually uh, to uh, look into this kind of literature through the Gender Innovations Portal. So the Gender Innovation is a is a big amazing. Uh, um, project uh, in between the US and Europe uh, and they have like this fantastic portal in which you have like a lot of uh, case studies not only in animal research also in other uh, in other domains uh, but from which you can get a lot of information and this is uh, especially important if you are developing a artificial intelligence system because it's really like you know tapping into the way in which the data are produced and what are the type of uh, of problems that you can have if this data is not produced in the in the proper ways and so with this, my last slide is just a reminder of uh, this uh, cycle, life cycle of uh, AI development and the fact that uh, all the data that we are uh, producing and, uh, and using for developing uh, artificial intelligence system is always, always coming from uh, our world. And our world, unfortunately, is full of inequalities and discriminations. And we have evidence of this uh, uh, by an equal access uh, or an equal resource all allocation, discriminatory health processes, biased clinical decision making, and as we saw uh, right now, also sometimes biased uh, preclinical uh, uh, studies, right? And so if we are using this biased data to develop uh, AI systems, we are going to develop biased AI systems. And if we are uh, deploying this biased AI system in the society, we are essentially reintroducing the bias and amplifying them in the world and so on and so on. So we have to find ways of like, you know, breaking this uh, vicious uh, circle. OK, so uh, with this, my main takeaway is that artificial intelligence is uh, pervasive in our society and increasingly so in the health domain. 
uh, a bias uh, as a definition is a systematic error that leads to a disadvantage for an individual or a, or a group of people. And uh, sex and gender biases are particularly prominent in artificial intelligence application, especially for uh, health. And those biases can emerge in all the stages of this AI life cycle. Possible solutions for combating uh, AI bias include uh, uh, implement processes to identify and reduce bias in AI systems with tools, strategies, and transparency, support AI bias research, enabling privacy respecting data access, and also applying a multidisciplinary approach, and also promoting diversity in artificial intelligence to better uh, address and prevent uh, bias. So thank you so much uh, for uh, your attention. Thank you to the Women's Benefit Foundation, uh, Aditech, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and also the Benefit for Women Initiative. Uh, here you have my contact, and uh, thank you all for your attention. I will be happy to reply to uh, all your questions. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, David. Ha sido fantástica tu presentación. Y... Y además con la parte final, que es algo que siempre repetimos, no, no solo, o sea, el tema era transversal hoy, pero, pero también esos modelos animales, ¿no? todo lo que se utiliza en el laboratorio, que luego acaba siendo datos en, ¿no? en, el, en los estudios ya de inteligencia artificial, pues si ya parten mal, eh, no hay nada que lo arregle. Exacto. <ríe> eh, Así que, bueno, ahora sí que todo, o sea, tenemos eso dentro del público. Espero personas que ya han escuchado estas cosas alguna vez o, eh, o incluso, bueno, la primera vez que lo escuchan. Entonces sí que queremos escucharos y aprovechar de verdad para preguntarle a David. Así que o directamente encendéis la cámara, el micro o, es, o escribís por el chat. que eh, No ha escrito a nadie en el chat, creo. Eh, pero bueno, de verdad, animaos y aprovechad que te, nos quedan 10 minutos por lo menos para, para que podáis plantear preguntas a David. Sí, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta puede simplemente abrir el micrófono y preguntar. Eh, además estoy muy curioso yo también de saber vuestra experiencia en, en este, con estos temas. Si son cosas, por ejemplo, que estáis teniendo en cuenta en vuestra investigación, si si lo que habéis visto, los que os he contado, no os puede ser, ser útil o si tenéis alguna duda, ¿no? simplemente respecto a todas estas, a todas estas cosas. Pues uh, sí, don't be shy y, y preguntad lo que, lo que sea. Mientras se anima a alguien, David, te iba a preguntar eh, algo que muchas veces ha salido en, otros, en otras formaciones presenciales o online. Eh, tú has recogido ya en, en tu presentación, en el caso concreto de, de lo que significa pedir presupuesto para tu laboratorio, para tu ensayo, cuando tienes que hacer ¿no? doble, eh, en teoría, el doble de, perdón, la mitad de sí. machos, la mitad de hembras, pero aparte de las cuestiones de, de, de dinero, ¿no? Que pueden, cuando alguien está formulando una propuesta de proyecto, al margen de eso, creo que también muchos investigadores e investigadoras sienten o piensan al principio, cuando se aproximan a, a este tema, que, que basta con un párrafo o que poniendo solo no. un trozo de una explicación en un punto, que eso ya basta para que el proyecto esté, se diga que está considerando la dimensión de género, ¿cómo les invitarías tú a que mm, se lo tomen eh, en serio en el sentido de hacerlo desde, de forma transversal en todo el proyecto? Sí, sí, absolutamente. De hecho, la, digamos, la, la sección de los, uh, de los proyectos europeos, eh, eh, que, que se llama justamente Gender Dimension, y lo que pide eh, es no tanto hablar, por ejemplo, un error muy común en estos proyectos es que eh, las personas piensen en la dimensión de género eh, simplemente como gender representation ¿no? o gender balance. Entonces se escriben cosas como, eh, sí, sí, vamos a, ¿no? en nuestro equipo, vamos a tener ¿no? un, un balanceo ¿no? de hombres y mujeres. Claro, esto es súper importante, es, un, es también ¿no? un aspecto ¿no? que hemos, que hemos um, subrayado antes, ¿no? la, la, la diversidad de los equipos. Pero en realidad, eh, los, lo que piden eh, los proyectos europeos, por ejemplo, en esta sección, es cómo integrar la dimensión de sexo y género en la investigación, o sea, en los métodos que estáis proponiendo. Entonces, todo, toda la parte, por ejemplo, de 
ahora tomo el ejemplo de los proyectos europeos porque eh, todos estamos no acostumbrados a escribir este, ¿no? este tipo de proyectos, pero toda la parte de la metodología. Se está refiriendo a eso, o sea, en plan, ¿cómo vais a, a qué tipo de, de propuesta metodológica vas a, a tener para integrar estos aspectos ¿no? en la investigación que, que se quiere ¿no? llevar a cabo? Y entonces esto puede ir desde, desde todos los aspectos que hemos visto, desde vamos a recoger los datos de esta manera porque podemos estar seguros ¿no? de que eh, vamos a tener suficiente representación. O, por ejemplo, si vamos a desarrollar inteligencia un modelo, vamos a hacer que el modelo sea explicable. O, o, por ejemplo, a nivel de, de output, eh, cualquier tipo de, de conclusión que saquemos, eh, la, nos vamos a comparar con las comunidades ¿no? que podrían estar involucradas, porque tenemos entre los partners, por ejemplo, no sé, de las asociaciones de pacientes o, eh, o, o fundaciones, organizaciones. Entonces, realmente se trata de eso. Y, y muchas veces, es, claro, la, la idea general es que no sé, es un check ¿no? que uno tiene simplemente que poner eh, eh, sin pensarlo demasiado. En realidad es una parte muy importante de los proyectos que está muy valorada y, y que determina muchas veces también, por ejemplo, la exclusión ¿no? de, 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 ¿no? de, 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 una, de, un, de un proyecto y, y en la que de verdad tenéis que pensar y, y conectar con la metodología. De, de verdad se refiere a cosas bastante técnicas en realidad. Eh, entonces, sí. Y lo mismo, creo, se aplica a los proyectos nacionales. Ahora, Tenemos una pregunta. Sí, sí, David, gracias por esa respuesta. El Hola, mío. David. Buenas tardes. Hola, soy Maitane. Sí, sí, yo soy compañera de Marusa de Aditec y bueno, también estoy metida en, en estos temas de, bueno, pues en dimensión de género, sobre todo cómo aplicarlo en los proyectos que llevamos. Sí. Entonces, eh, yo tenía una pregunta. Ya has comentado como que mediante estadística también, o sea, pues sí. por el estudio de la NOVA, ¿no? Por ejemplo, se podría como eh, un poco dar solución a, a, a cuando no se tiene, eh, pues por ejemplo, la mitad de, de los animales, ¿no? Por ejemplo, de un estudio clínico de la, o de, o de human, en humanos, ¿no? Me refiero. Eh, o sea, cuando no tenemos mitad y mitad, que podríamos recurrir a la estadística, pero siempre entiendo que será mejor tener, ¿no? Un 50% de cada de, ¿no? de cada sexo en este caso, ¿no? Sí. Um, claro, sí, la, la, el power analysis, que generalmente se hace ¿no? también a la hora, por ejemplo, de organizar, no o sé, sea, un clinical trial, ¿no? un estudio de cualquier tipo, ¿no? Eh, previamente, ¿no? Se tiene que determinar, ¿no? Cuán, cuánto, cuál es, el, por ejemplo, el tamaño mostral, ¿no? Que necesitas. Sí. Pues todas estas técnicas eh, se, se pueden aplicar, ¿no? En estos casos también, para, por ejemplo, saber... Eh, cuál, como decía antes, ¿no? ¿Cuál es el número mínimo, por ejemplo, de animales, ambos eh, machos y hembras, que, eh, que vas a necesitar? Eh, si el efecto del tratamiento eh, es muy fuerte, y, pues lo vas a ver, aunque teniendo pocos animales. Ese es un poco el mensaje, ¿no? Uh -huh. Que si realmente hay un efecto fu fuerte, sí. lo vas a ver, aunque reduciendo ¿no? el número, eh, el, el, la muestra. Y entonces, claro, esto lo puedes estimar, ¿no? Si tienes, por ejemplo, no sé, algún dato previo o alguna ¿no? información ¿no? que puede ¿no? llevarte a simular también, por ejemplo, este tipo de cosas. Pero el segredo es, como un poco recomendaba, o sea, no pasar por alto eh, sí. el, el, el power analysis clásico eh, porque puede dar mucha información cuando está aplicado ¿no? a este tipo de cosas. Eh, y también otra, otro punto es que muchas veces las personas dicen... Ah, yo tengo un dataset desbalanceado uh -huh. eh, on purpose porque la incidencia de esta enfermedad es de, hay un desbalance. A lo mejor sí. es una enfermedad donde se da sí. más en hombres y menos en mujeres. Pero claro, esto tampoco va bien porque si tú entrenas una a la inteligencia artificial le da igual de la incidencia. O sea, la inteligencia artificial quiere algo balanceado para que aprenda de eso uh -huh. para que extraiga la información de forma eficiente. Y entonces, claro, en el mundo real es verdad de que lo que ves, las observaciones a lo mejor están desbalanceadas por un tema de, de incidencia ¿no? de, la, de la enfermedad. Pero si tienes que usar unos datos para entrenar algo y este algo se basa sobre la cantidad de información que le da, tienen que estar balanceados. Y puedes balancearlo incluso con datos sintéticos, o sea, si no los tienen, ¿no? O sea, puedes, por ejemplo, ¿no? crear simulaciones y crear datos sintéticos. Pero es importante para la IA 
che, eh, che se haga algo, no? Se ha, che, che se, se, se mitighe da alguna forma este sí. imbalance. Mm -hmm. Vale. O sea, pero entonces, David, siempre, o sea, tenderemos siempre eso, eso a tener, o sea, a, 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 bueno, a tener en esos eh, análisis clínicos siempre eso, la mit ¿no? O sea, mitad y mitad, ¿no? Vamos a, a intentar eso y si no... ¿no? Pues ir a por otras vías de, pues como estadística, ¿no? Te re, o sea, a, eso, a eso te referías antes, ¿no? A sí. otras, ¿no? Otro Exacto. tipo de estudio, vale. Uh -huh. Sí, o si no, si por ejemplo, en el caso del, en el caso del desbalanceado, si no puedes hacer nada, pues hay toda una serie de otras técnicas, ¿no? Yeah. Que te permiten, por ejemplo, uh -huh. de, o sea, entrenar un modelo, pero ajustando los, los pesos, vale. ¿no? En base a la representación. ¿no? O sea, es, es un poco eso. Y ese es el tipo de cosas que cuando en estos proyectos europeos ¿no? se dice cómo vas a abordar ¿no? la, 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 la dimensión de, de sexo y género, es esto, es, es realmente matemática, estadística, ¿no? es, uh -huh. es muy técnico y, y no es simplemente, a, a, digamos, ¿no? o sea, sí, eso, ¿no? también en la parte social, ¿no? que, que es importante, pero son, son, ¿no? uh -huh. muchas veces yo veo un poco una negligencia ¿no? en, este, en este sentido. ¿no? Sí. Eh, sí, de acuerdo. Vale, pues muchas gracias y, y felicidades por la presentación. Gracias. Gracias. Maitane, gracias por romper el hielo. Así que venga, por favor, animaos. Eh, que, bueno, son y 46, pero si alguien tiene o le ha pasado, ¿no? Alguna cosa en concreto y quiere ponerla en común. Mira, otra pregunta. Carmen. Adelante, Carmen. Estás muy bien. Le he dado sin querer, perdón. Ah, le... ah bueno, la, le has dado la, a la mano levantada sin querer. Okay. Le he dado a la mano sin querer, sí. Estamos duda, con Carmen, los mandos Carmen, en la operativa y, y, y le he dado a la mano sin querer. Ok. Vale, David, mira, a raíz de lo que preguntaba Maitane, eh, sí. me ha entrado la duda también, claro, para que un modelo de inteligencia artificial, para que aprenda, ¿no? Para hacer el algoritmo sí. correcto, decías, bueno, hay que intentar que los datos sean equilibrados. Y tú hablabas de la, la prevalencia, en castellano decimos la prevalencia de una enfermedad, ¿no? Sí. Eh, que el cáncer de mama, por ejemplo, eso en mujeres, pues se da muchísimo, pero también hay hombres a los que claro. se le da... En este caso en concreto de cáncer de mama, ¿habría que hacer un modelo con el, exactamente el mismo, o sea, coger solo el mismo cantidad de datos de cáncer de mama o intentar limpiar y, y cinco y cinco, por ejemplo? O sea, para que a los no, hombres cosa, no se les claro, discriminase. En, el caso, en casos tan eh, extremos en el que, por ejemplo, el cáncer de mama en hombres no, es, es bastante raro, ¿no? Con, no, no hay una, la prevalencia no es muy, es muy baja. Eh, pero claro, en, eh, en este caso yo lo que haría yo eh, son dos modelos distintos, o sea, uno para hombres ¿no? y otro para mujer. Si quisieras hacer un modelo único, claro, deberías encontrar la forma de, eh, de, de aumentar los datos, de balancearlo de alguna forma. Pero sí, realmente, porque imagina, por ejemplo, si tú le das ¿no? estos datos a, a un modelo, si tú dados desbalanceados a un modelo con muy pocos hombres, Claro, el modelo aprenderá lo más frecuente, aprenderá que las características más frecuentes serán características de, de las mujeres. Y entonces este modelo funcionará fatal cuando lo aplicas ¿no? a, a un hombre. Y, y entonces, claro, ¿cuál es el, ¿por qué? ¿Por qué funciona fatal? Funciona fatal porque tiene tan pocos datos que realmente no puede extraer información de ahí. ¿no? estará totalmente sesgado, ¿no? este es un poco el, el, el problema. Y entonces, claro, una solución para esto es o reducir el número de, ¿no? de, 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 bueno, de, de mujeres, a lo mejor tenerlas igualmente representativas ¿no? de toda la variedad que, puedes, que, que hay, de hecho hay mucha heterogeneidad en el cáncer de mama eh, femenino, eh, para equilibrar ¿no? con, con los hombres, o intentar aumentar, ¿no? aumentar el, el, el tamaño mostrar del, del, de, los, ¿no? de los datos masculinos con datos sintéticos o recogiendo a lo mejor más información. ¿no? Pero claro, en algunos casos muy extremo es, es difícil. Estoy totalmente eh, aware of it. Ya, yeah. ya. Yeah, yeah. Gracias. Eh, bueno, pues oye, eh, ya hemos dado un par de oportunidades, así que nada, creo que eh, eso, cerramos la sesión, ha sido un auténtico placer escucharte, 
Eh, os recordamos que esta sesión, eso, la volveremos, la colgaremos en el repositorio web de Aditec. Si vais a la página web de aditec.com, en la sección de iniciativas, hay una que se llama Dimensión de Género y ahí en Investigación con Dimensión de Género tenéis todo lo que hemos ido recopilando desde hace años ya, eh, así como una guía de ayuda para tenerlo todos los temas ¿no? variados y que pueda interesar a, también la heterogeneidad del sistema navarro de investigación que, que, eso, que va desde la salud, la inteligencia artificial, ingeniería, renovables, lo que sea. Entonces, bueno, eh, un placer, David, y muchísimas gracias. Nos vemos pronto. Gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego. Adiós. Gracias.